Greetings to you all ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. George Xavier Kota and I welcome you back to the channel. So thank you very much to Chavi Chodi for watching through the videos and requesting that I make some of those videos. It really is um, good for you and hopefully I can help you out with some of the videos that I still need to make. We'll try and make them in a short space of time so that you have enough time to prepare for your examinations. So moving on to question 40. The question is, what alterations are the most likely to be visible on atrogram? The question at hand is, for three years, we have a 31-year-old woman. So remember that age is very important. It's a very important factor when you're considering these questions. So it's a 31-year-old female who's complaining of pain and swelling <coughs> within her radio carbo and metacarbophalangeal joints uh, or metacarbophalangeal articulations. We also have reduced mobility, which is happening mainly in the morning and is persisting for up to one and a half hours. So two weeks ago, she developed pain and swelling and reddening of her knee joints and a body temperature increase to 37.5. So these symptoms have already been continuing and have increased to 37.5. And then treatment was belated and then examination of internal organs is showing nothing. The diagnosis uh, of course is rheumatoid arthritis. So what alterations do you expect in your case of rheumatoid arthritis that will be probably be visible uh, <coughs> On, on ultrasound. So joint space narrowing and ulcerations are the ones that we're going to expect. Again, remember for, for these questions that I'm looking at, the correct answer is A. So joint space narrowing is the correct answer in this case. So the reason why this is joint space narrowing is because this patient has a, a classical clinical presentation of rheumatoid arthritis, which we know is most commonly going to have, um, most, most commonly going to affect radiocarpal joints or metacarpophalangeal articulations and there's also going to be uh, reduced mobility. This is going to be very different from the other signs you can see in other joint diseases such as joint space narrowing, um, which is in this case joint space narrowing as well as uh, cyst in the subchondral bone and development of osteophytes. These are findings you're most likely going to be seeing in uh, <clears throat> osteoarthritis and if you remember the age of the patient that we're dealing with, this is a woman who is fairly young. So with rheumatoid arthritis, it's usually the age range of 20 to 40 years of age. But if you have diseases such as osteoarthritis, it's going to be usually in, a, in an older person. So <clears throat> with that being said, um, for osteoarthritis, the pain um, is actually worse uh, with movement. But for rheumatoid arthritis, the pain uh, is relieved towards the end of the day, so it's going to be getting better with movement. But usually with osteoarthritis, they usually say the pain is intense and by the end of the day, uh, the pain is very worse. Moving on to the next question. The question at hand is, what additional tests should be performed uh, to make the diagnosis? So what we have is a 50-year-old woman uh, was complaining of spontaneous bruises, um, weakness, bleeding, as well as dizziness. Subjectively, the mucous membranes and skin are pale, which is uh, usually a sign of blood loss or anemia, and the numerous hemorrhages of various type of, which are various time of origin. The lymph nodes are not enlarged, uh, which potentially tells us there's no infection that's occurring uh, within the patient. But the pulse is increased, uh, blood pressure is 110 over 70, so pulse is increased at 100, uh, there are no other alterations to the internal organs. So from the complete blood count, the results are red blood cell is 3, uh, the hemoglobin is 92, the color index is 9, uh, you also have anisocytosis, uh, poikilocytosis, as well as uh, white blood cells that are 10, and eosinophil is 2%, stab neutrophil is 12%, and uh, segmented neutrophils 68% and lymphocytes 11%, monocytes 7% and an ESR of 12 uh, millimeters per hour. So the question at hand is um, what sort of test needs to be performed to make your diagnosis? Now the answer is platelets. Now the reason why we're saying it's platelets or the reason why uh, it's platelets is because the patient has signs um, of spontaneous bruises, bleeding, the uh, weakness, the gums, the skin is pale, and hemorrhage uh, of various time of origin, but has normal 
blood count of all the other bloodlines. So this is most likely going to be due to thrombocytopenia, which is basically a decreased amount of platelets. Um, for reticular sites, you usually do this if you're looking at or thinking about anemia, uh, which is not the case in this scenario. And um, clotting times or bleeding times are usually thought about in terms of um, bleeding disorders that involve coagulation uh, problems. So if you have problems with your coagulation, then maybe you can do clotting time or partial thermoplasting time um, <clears throat> and those other other tests. So moving on to the next question, uh, question being what additional preventive therapy should be administered prior to surgery? Um, the answer here is, um, before I look at the question, the answer is increased prednisolone and dosage. Um, I feel like this is more of a cramming question. It didn't really make sense when I made sense when I, when I went over it, but We'll go over the question. So we have um, a patient who had tonsillectomy, who was a woman uh, with uh, systemic lupus erythematis. So she has been given, been, she has been taken uh, prednisolone for a year, and has developed acute weakness, nausea and vomiting, and pain in the right iliac region. And she has watery stools about five times per day. And then her blood pressure is low because she has been losing a lot uh, from the diarrhea and passes uh, is still normal. Um, <clears throat> and then what preventive therapy should have been administered prior to surgery? Um, the answer is increase, increasing the dose of prednisolone. Um, maybe the thought process will be that since this is an autoimmune, maybe the symptoms are not that controlled, hence you'd increase prednisolone. But I don't have a lot of input um, regarding this, this question. So I'll move on to the next question. Um, and then, so for question 43, the question at hand is, um, what is the most likely diagnosis among those that are listed? So what is the most likely diagnosis among those that are listed? So the question is, we have a 45-year-old woman. Uh, she's complaining of paroxysmal intolerable facial pain on the left, which attacks at least with attacks that last for one to two minutes. The attacks are provoked by chewing, and the disease onset was two months ago following exposure to cold. Objectively, the, the pain, pain at the exit points of the trigeminal nerve on the left, so the trigeminal nerve is involved, attaching near the wing of the nose on the left, which induces new pain. So touching near the wing of the nose on the left induces new pain attack with tonic spasms of the facial muscles. So the correct answer here is trigeminal neuralgia. So this is a classic picture that you would see with trigeminal neuralgia because you have very intolerable pain attacks that last for a short period of time that are, that are um, caused by chewing or, or pressing uh, the nose as they did, so like a stimulatory test that they did, uh, which can then result in new pain and tonic spasms of the muscles. And then in the question, them also telling you that the trigeminal nerve is involved is also something that you'd have to consider and say most likely it's going to be uh, a trigeminal neuralgia. So basically what a trigeminal neuralgia is, it's a chronic disorder which affects the fifth nerve, the trigeminal nerve, which can be of two types, which are typical or atypical. A typical form results with episodes of severe sudden shock-like pain on one side of the face, which lasts from a few seconds to roughly about a few minutes. In this case, they had mentioned that it was lasting for about one to two minutes. And then in the typical form, it results in a constant burning pain that is less severe and then episodes may be triggered by touching the face um, and <clears throat> and um, or other like other motions within the face like chewing as well um, and then I think what I've seen in practice is I've mostly seen patients that have presented with the typical form of trigeminal neuralgia and them mentioning that um, they're having a electrifying 
pain within the distribution of the trigeminal nerve. Uh, <clears throat> now, because uh, of the three divisions of the trigeminal nerve, uh, the, of, of the ophthalmic nerve, the maxillary nerve, and the mandibular nerve, the trigeminal neuralgia can be di distributed differently. Um, and then the other one, other option here is glossopharyngeal neuralgia. This is more of a rare case, and I don't think they'll test you on this one, but it's basically ex extreme pain within the distribution of the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is mostly at the back of the throat, the tongue, and the ear. Uh, also has shock-like pain, um, can also be triggered by swallowing. And then temporal mandibular um, joint of um, joint arthritis uh, would probably have some subfebrile, um, subfebrile temperatures, signs of inflammation or swelling within the joint area. Um, facial neuro migraine would have uh, a person complaining of headache that is presenting with the pulsating pain uh, that is one-sided, and then some cases they can be sensitive to light or sensitive to no to to noises or loud sounds, and then in some cases these migraines can be triggered by different things, including um, food, sometimes wine, or alcohol beverages, and and other things. And then maxillary sinusitis they usually have uh, a a blocked nose, uh, signs of flu, um, loss of smell and loss of taste as well. So moving on to question 40, 44, the, uh, the question at hand here is, uh, what sort of pathology are we dealing with? So going back to the beginning of the question, so we have a 28 year old man who complains of skin rash and itching, uh, which is seen on both sides of his hands. And this has been occurring for roughly about 1.5 years. And then this is excessive, this the exacerbation of his condition he ascribes to occupational contact with formaldehyde. Um, objectively, you have lesions that are symmetrical, localized in both arms or hands, and against the background of erythema, which is blurred by margins where there's papillae, vesicles, erosions, and crests. What sort of pathology does the patient have? Um, this is occupational eczema. Main reason for this uh, is because um, you have a patient telling you that this is occurring because of where they are working and they're exposed to formaldehyde. So this is um, more of a simpler uh, question. And this is all I have for that question. So moving to the next question. So what symptom is the most contributive for the diagnostics of this disease. So what we have is um, a 10 year old boy, sorry. So we have a 10 year old boy with arthritis and myocarditis who has been delivered to the hospital. Based on the clinical examination and preliminary diagnosis, there is juvenile um, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, what symptom is the most contributive to the diagnostics uh, of this disease. So <clears throat> this is similar to the question that we did earlier where we know that uh, rheumatoid arthritis um, affects the joints. So arthritis affects the joints and there's inflammation of the joints. Juvenile because they're young. So that's mostly the key that you can think about. And then in terms of symptomatology, you're going to have reduced mobility of the joints, which is mainly seen in the morning lasting for 30 minutes or longer and it usually gets better with motion or moving the joint and then the pain decreases as the day progresses. Um, this is also similar to what we have discussed um, and this is also very specific to rheumatoid arthritis. Hyperemia of the joints is, um, is non-specific to rheumatoid arthritis. That can occur with any arthritis. Affection of large joints um, is not very common for rheumatoid arthritis because remember it can involve the uh, radiocarpal or metacarpal phalangeals. Uh, although it can affect uh, large joints, but it solely affecting large joints not amongst the diagnostic criteria. In large dogs, although this can occur, this is not the main diagnosing uh, factor as well as 
uh, increased heart rate, uh, although that can occur is, is not the main diagnostic factor that you're going to have in the disease. So moving on to the next question that we have for today is, um, so what is the most likely diagnosis in this case? Um, so we have uh, a 40, a 25 year old patient that has been delivered to the infectious disease unit on day three uh, with illness that um, with illness with complaints of headache, pain in the lumbar spine, um, as well as the gast gastrocnemius muscles, high fevers, as well as chills. So objectively, the condition is of moderate severity. Uh, the sclera are ecteric. Uh, pharynx is hyperemic, the tongue is dry with, with dry brown coating, uh, the abdomen is distended, the liver is enlarged roughly about 2 centimeters by 2 centimeters, uh, the spleen is not enlarged, palpation of muscles, especially the, the gastrocnemius muscles, um, is, is going to be painful. Urine is dark in color, uh, fishes are normal in color, and this. So the question is, what is the most likely diagnosis? So leptospirosis is our answer. The reason why that is our answer is because the patient is presenting with classic signs of leptospirosis, which include having a headache, a fever, pain in the gastrocnemius muscles, which are mainly specific to this disease rather than other diseases. And then um, leptospirosis, what it is, is an infection caused by um, a corkscrew shaped bacteria which is called leptospira uh, symptoms and signs can range including the ones that we've mentioned above but in some cases it can also affect the lungs as well as causing meningitis so in the case where the person's skin is yellow that could mean that there's um, problems with the liver uh, as well as potential kidney problems that can occur in the disease as well as bleeding and then there's a form of the disease that is known as Wells disease, which is uh, characterized by having um, ecteris, um, a kidney failure as well as bleeding. So it can also potentially complicate and cause um, severe pulmonary hemorrhagic syndrome. So for the other disorders uh, with viral hepatitis, yes, you can get enlargement um, of, the, of the liver. Yes, you can get um, signs of jaundice or ecteris. Um, but you don't really get gastrocnemius uh, pain. You can get uh, some sort of fever or subfebrile fever with, uh, with viral hepatitis, but you don't really have um, pain within the gastrocnemius muscle. And then the other thing for malaria, um, at least usually for malaria, it's not endemic or common in Ukraine. So usually they, they'll let you know the region of the person or maybe the person traveled to Africa or South America, um, hence they're presenting with, uh, with malaria. And then they would have um, signs of fever that can occur with malaria. And then um, the other um, infectious disease mentions here um, are not really um, specific uh, in relation to this disorder. So the key is remembering that gastrocnemius muscles as well as the the other symptoms that you have in this stem are going to be uh, specific to leptospirosis. Uh, moving on to the next question. So the question is, uh, what disease are we dealing with? What disease is it? So we have a 28 year old woman who is complaining of skin hemorrhages from minor traumas or so after minor traumas and a spontaneous appearance of hemorrhages in front of her torso and extremities. So in examination, the skin is variegated, meaning that they old and new hemorrhages. So skin is variegated. And then patient also has bleeding gums. Uh, platelet count is 20, which is uh, very low in this case. And then in the bone marrow, there are increased number of megakaryocytes but no platelet production. So treatment is going to be with steroid hormones, uh, which was uh, effective. So this is going to be um, idiopathic thrombocytopenia, uh, which means that this is a disorder of the platelets. 
Uh, the reason why is because the patient is presenting with um, spontaneous hemorrhages or hemorrhages in the extremities as well as the gums. And then you see that in your bone marrow examination, although you have increased number of megakaryocytes, there's no platelet production. Uh, usually uh, idiopathic uh, thrombocytopenic is an autoimmune disorder, uh, which means that um, your platelets are going to be destroyed by your own cells. The cause is not really known, hence the word idiopathic. Um, and um, what else is very specific for this? Uh, you're going to have a low platelet count. In this case, it's 20. Uh, this is going to be different from hemophilia because hemophilia is a coagulopathy. So usually uh, they would mention um, a young boy because it's an uh, autosomal. Um, it's, no, it's six linked. Uh, it's, it's an X-linked disorder which usually uh, commonly affects uh, boys or is it autosomal recessive? Okay, I don't remember whether it's autosomal recessive or, or sex-linked recessive. Uh, you can just check that one because uh, I, I can't check right now. But uh, hemophilia is a, is a clotting disorder where um, you have problems with the clotting factors uh, which can be 8, 9, or 11. So they're different types. And then... Um, I don't know much about Rendu Osler Weber disease. Um, I don't really, I don't think I've seen that in practice. And as far as crop questions are concerned, um, I've never really seen this being asked in the exam. And then disseminated intravascular coagulation is a condition whereby, um, for example, let's say you're in a septic shock and you've been in, the patient has been uh, infected. Um, there is a rapid response and a rapid usage of your platelets such that they try and um, aggregate and form platelet aggregations which leads to a, a loss of platelets which then results to a uh, spontaneous bleeding so you have fast a uh, rapid usage and loss of your platelets that's why you end up having um, um, disseminated intravascular coagulation and um, I don't know much about acute vascular uh, pupilla to, to be able to explain it very well. Um, all right, so for today, I think I'll stop here and then I'll continue the rest of the questions tomorrow. I'm trying to make the, the videos short so that you don't spend a lot of time uh, looking at just one video. I'm just trying to go over the questions as fast as possible and explain things that I'm, I'm sure of and things that I've used and seen in the past days. So thank you very much for, for watching. Um, please feel free to, to comment and add any suggestions if you, if you have any suggestions for, for the videos to make them better for, for you guys. With that being said, bye-bye.